Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our YouTube series to help you improve your chess game. We're going to do something fairly basic today, so if you're an advanced player, probably check out a different playlist. Uh, this is going to be kind of the basic stuff. So when people come to me for lessons and they're not very good, they're all worried about how to play the caro can. They're worried about, you know, I might get a doubled pawn. These things aren't really very important. So I wrote a novice nook a long time ago, and I called it the three showstoppers. Why do I use the name showstopper? Because a showstopper is something that if you don't do it right, that stops the show. That can lose you the game. And that's the kind of things that if you work at and you get better at, you get the most bang for the buck in your improvement. And there's three showstoppers. So let's talk about each of the three, and we'll give a couple examples. All right, the first showstopper is safety. Unfortunately, when you do tactics books, tactics and chess safety are basically the kind of the same thing, tactics being the science of chess safety. When you do tactics books, it's usually white to play and win, white to play and mate and two. Those are all offensive tactics. You're the one who is trying to win material, you're the one who's trying to mate, and your opponent has already done something wrong with his position that you can win his material or mate by four. So yes, that's very important. You have to be able to see that your opponent's moves are not safe, and if they're not safe, you have to be able to win material. But possibly even more important is you have to make safe moves yourself. I have some earlier videos on is your move safe, and that's the other part of safety, is if you make a move, are you giving your opponent a forcing sequence where he can win material or checkmate you? If you are, then your move is not safe, you lose material or you get mated. If you do that on purpose and you know you're losing material, we call that a sacrifice. But otherwise, you're trying to make safe moves so that your opponent does not lose material. Uh, sorry, that you don't lose material. And when he makes unsafe moves, you want to see if you can win the material. But tactics aren't just you winning material. Tactics are also you playing safe moves, moves so that if you play that move, your opponent has no forcing move of check, capture, or threat that'll win the material. All right, so let's give an example of an offensive tactic. I once had a student who had a game. He opened up e4, e5, knight f3, and black played knight e7. So my student said, all right, I want to control the center. I want to open up lines. I want to develop my pieces. I have a move that does almost all of that. I can play d4, which opens up a line for my other bishop. It attacks his pawn. It controls the center. It's a really good move. And my answer was, well, that's the kind of thing you want to be doing if you're not winning something. But the whole idea of getting good positions is to some extent so that your army will be better than his and you can win material or you can checkmate him. But here, black just had blundered. Black did not save his pawn on e5. So by far the best move here is not to play d4, but to capture the pawn, knight takes e5 and say, thanks for the pawn. Now I'm up material. Now... I'm the one who's winning the game. It only takes one bad mistake to lose a game, and how bad does it have to be? Well, if both players are good players, even up a pawn could be enough to win the game. And sure, if you're a beginner, you're probably not good enough to win a game up a pawn, but that doesn't mean it's not a large advantage. If it's a good enough advantage that it could win a game for a good player, then even at your level, if, you, if you're not winning a game, it's still a big advantage. You shouldn't treat it like, oh, he'll probably win a pawn back later. Well, maybe he will and maybe he won't. But you actually have enough of an advantage that you'd be winning the game. For instance, let's, let's show you what Stockfish 13 thinks about that move. If you play a, a move that's not knight takes pawn, let's say you play um, bishop e2 so you can castle. Stockfish says you're up by about half a pawn. A little more than that now. But if you take the pawn... Stockfish says you're up by about a little less than two pawns here. You can see the evaluation in parentheses. Right now it's 1.82. It's jumping all around. If we go to just to the best move, so it'll go faster. 1.77, 1.62, 1.62, 1 1.64. So white's up a little more than a pawn and a half here by taking that pawn. So that's winning material. That's what you're trying to do. If your opponent makes bad moves, you want to take advantage of them. Now suppose black was already down a queen. Let's take the queen off the board here for black. Mr. Queen, go away. Okay, now knight takes e5 is the computer's best move, 
But if you're, you're a human and all you want to do now that you're up a queen is get out your pieces and castle, well, that's perfectly good now. Winning a pawn is no big deal. If you win the pawn, you're up 13 pawns. If you get out the bishop, you're only up a little less than 13 pawns. Well, it only takes about one pawn to win a game, and being up 13 pawns is plenty. So winning that extra pawn isn't such a big deal. Just like in sports, if your team is up, you know, let's say you're playing basketball and your team's up 100 to 2, getting the next basket isn't so important. But if it's 199 or 100 to 100, then getting that next basket means that means a big deal. So when you're way, way ahead, getting more ahead isn't always the number one strategy. So when white played knight f3, let's take it back to the original position. When white played knight f3 to attack the pawn, if black doesn't save it, white has a counting tactic. I get a pawn, he gets nothing. That particular counting tactic we call on pres. If black plays a6, take the pawn. Okay, so black normally says, I'm not going to let you get that pawn. It's not a tactic because I have a defense. I can play knight c6 and save the pawn, and therefore knight f3 is not a tactic. It's just a threat. It only becomes a tactic if black blunders and gives you the tactic of winning the pawn. All right, let's talk about uh, that's an offensive tactic to take the pawn. Defensive tactics, well, there's lots of moves where you have to check to see if your move is safe. When it's your move, you can't just make a move and then go, oh, whoops. Let's, uh, let's bring out a puzzle that I show people. Uh, let's go to ptlib2%44. I guess it would help if I bring up a sheet. Okay, there we go. Um, so here, black, let's flip the board. It's black's move. And white has a double attack between the knight and the rook. And now the tactical issue for black is you have to play the safest move you can. Well, if you simply say rooks are worth more than knights and you save the rook and you give up a knight for nothing, now you're down a bishop for two pawns and you're pretty much losing the game. But if you save the knight and you give him the rook, then you get to recapture with the king and you don't lose a whole rook, you lose a rook for a bishop. And losing a rook for a bishop is about half as bad as losing a whole knight. And now black has a knight and two extra pawns against a rook, and he has about an equal endgame. If we let Stockfish use this uh, position to show you the difference, if I play rook to d8, Stockfish will say, after bishop takes a5, white is ahead by about three and a half pawns, three and a third pawns. That's way enough to win the game. But if black had saved the knight and white had taken the, the rook for the bishop, then white's lead is very, very much smaller. Instead of three and a half pawns, it's only about a third of a pawn, which means black should be able to save the game. So this is a defensive idea. You have to lose the least that you can. So when you're playing chess, safety is number one <clears throat> when you can win something that gets you ahead. And when you're on the other side of it, you want to lose nothing. Or in this kind of case, you want to lose as little as you can. These are very, very important safety issues. So when you're studying tactics, you could start with a book like uh, Starting Out Chess Tactics and Checkmates by Ward. You could buy Bobby Fisher Teaches Chess. You could buy John Bain's Chess Tactics for Students. These are all basic tactics books. I have a list on my website, danheisman.com. If you go on the right to more and go down to recommended book lists, I have a list of basic tactics books where you work on these safety issues. Now, it's true, most of those books are almost all offensive tactics, but you have to think of them as potentially defensive tactics, too, where if you make a move, you have to check to see if your move is safe. Let's do one more like that. Let's put out number 198. Okay, so I say to people, is it safe for black to take the pawn on b5? And right now it looks like, well, maybe it is. The pawn on b5 is attacked by the queen. It's black's move. Uh, if black takes that pawn, nobody can take the queen. Well, but if you quickly take that pawn, then white will play queen to h6, threatening checkmate on the next move. And there's no way to stop it. It's what we call an unstoppable threat. 
So if you play Mo's without looking to see what your opponent can do, and he makes an unstoppable threat, then no matter how long you look at the board, no matter how good you are, it's too late. You should have seen that on the previous move, and now black's going to get checkmated. So black's job in this first of the three showstoppers is to make sure his move is safe. Queen takes b5 is not safe. What would have been a safe move? Well, he could have played queen to d8, and then if white plays queen h6, he could have played queen f8 guarding the mate square, or he could have played king to h8, and on queen h6, threatening mate, he could have played rook g8, but you have to figure this out the move before. You can't just say, oh, that pawn's not guarded, let's take it, and then your opponent plays queen h6, and you say, oh, whoops, what am I going to do now? I didn't see that. Well, you didn't see it, but the, on top of that, there's just no defense. So playing safe, making safe moves, looking ahead at least one move, and making sure your opponent can't do something to you that you can't stop, is a very, very basic and very important part of chess. All right, so the first showstopper is safety, and we've looked at safety from the offensive side. How do you win things? How do you checkmate? We look things from the defensive side. How do you avoid losing material? How do you lose the least material possible? How do you avoid getting checkmated? Making safe moves is the other side. All right, the second showstopper is activity. Activity means you want to use all your pieces all the time. If you're a football coach and you're allowed 11 guys on the field, at the start of the game, you put 11 guys on the field. If you're a basketball coach and you're allowed five guys on the field, you put five guys on the field. If you're a baseball coach and you're allowed nine guys on the field, on defense, you put nine guys on the field. So you're always putting the maximum. Well, in chess, if we set up the pieces at the start, we're allowed to move all 16 of your pieces. But in general, what we're trying to do is activate the eight that are behind the pawns, the non-pawns. And that includes the king. The king's not going to be activated in the sense that he's going to go out and fight right away. The king's going to be activated in the sense that he's going to go someplace safe for the middle game, which usually means to castle early and often. That's a little bit of a joke. But you want to castle as soon as you can. We had an earlier video that was also basic on what I called the, uh, the classical development, which is I'm just going to move the white pieces here. I'll just move the knight back and forth. You move out two center pawns. You bring out the knight on the side. You're going to castle. You bring out the bishop on the side. You're going to castle. You castle. You bring out the knight on the opposite side. You bring out the bishop on the opposite side. You get the queen off the back rank to somewhere active. You get a rook into a better square. Get the other rook to a better square. This is classical development. It would be even better if I had this pawn on c4 and I had more space for my pieces. Uh, but I'm following the most important principle in the opening, which is move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. Now, if you know there's a book move where you move a piece twice, okay, that's fine. And if there's a tactic, then either you have to play on offense to win material or you have to play on defense to stop from losing material, then you're going to have to move pieces twice. But other than that, you're just trying to get out your pieces as safely, quickly, and efficiently as possible. <clears throat> so in this case, I've moved every one of these pieces once. I'm trying to get them all in the game, and that includes, of course, getting my king castled. So I'm trying to keep my pieces active. Now let's say we get to the end game. Let's uh, create some sort of random end game position. All right, so we have an end game here. Let's give ourselves a knight and a rook, and we'll give black a, uh, a rook and a, maybe a bishop. All right, in this kind of position, we want to use all our pieces all the time, but now the king is a major player for both sides. So we're still using the exact same rule, which is use all your pieces all the time, and we're using, and we have the principle move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. But that principle is just for the opening. In the end game, we've already moved all our pieces once, long, long time ago in the opening. But now what we want to do is use all our pieces. Well, rooks are worth five, knights and bishops are worth, you know, three and a half or something. 
But the king has a fighting value too. You can't trade a king. The king has no trading value, but it does have a fighting value. The king's fighting value is like four and a quarter. If you don't bring your king out and fight here, then you're missing part of the point. So for instance here, uh, white could play king f1 to get his king toward the middle. If black attacks the knight, you know, maybe we can save it. He could try to remove the guard. I can still save it. He can't check me over here because of the knight. And now what I'm trying to do later, he's going to get his king in the game. Maybe I'll get my king in the game. Maybe my king can come over here. Let's see here. Let's make it black's turn. Um, just going to make a random move for black. H6. White's king can actually come in and attack that bishop. Bishop says, all right, I'll go back. And the king is now a very strong piece. The black king has also come out. He couldn't get to the middle because the white rook was blocking him. But this is the kind of thing you're trying to do. You're trying to get your king in the game. I might not have played the best moves, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point, which is in this position, if white were to just play with his rook and his knight, and black were to just play with his rook and his bishop, they'd both be playing with one hand tied behind their back. You want to use all your pieces all the time, and once your king gets to be safe in the end game, He's one of those pieces you want to use. Let's take a look at an opening where you try to get all your pieces in the game. Let's look at a line in the, uh, the uh, Yugoslav dragon. <clears throat> so e4, c5, knight f3, white develops a knight. Black uses his pawns to get some control of the center. Pawn takes, knight takes. Black develops his knight and attacks the pawn. White develops a knight and guards it. Black plays the dragon, so-called because these pawns look like a little dragon. White develops a bishop. Black develops the bishop. He fanchettos through the middle of the board. He's attacking those squares. White plays f3 to overprotect his e-pawn and stop the knight from harassing his nice bishop. Black castles. White plays queen to d2, knight c6. All right, let's play the bishop c4 line. White plays bishop c4. Black plays bishop d7. Now white needs to castle. He castles, which also happens to put his rook on a semi-open file. <clears throat> Black needs to put his rook on a semi-open file. He does. Now he's threatening discovered attacks on the bishop. White usually says, okay, I, I want to get this rook in the game, but I need to save the bishop. So here, in order to prevent these discovered attacks, for the first time, white's going to move a piece twice. And now let's say black could bring his queen into the game, queen a5. And now white wants to get this rook in the game. Well, he could bring it to the middle like rook fe1. But the more normal way of playing in this kind of position is to push this pawn and try to play the break move h5, even if you have to sacrifice a pawn, and open up this line for the rook to attack the king. So the only piece on the board now that's not doing anything is this black rook on f8. All the other pieces have moved once except for this bishop that had to get out of the way of the discovered attack. If we go back two moves, this is called a loose piece or a hanging piece. It's not guarded by anything. And as soon as this knight moves, the rook's threatening to take the knight. Usually you don't wait till someone starts attacking you like that and then go, hmm, how am I gonna save him? Usually you prevent him having a tactic at all. So it's a good idea as a preventative tactic here for white to make that bishop guarded by putting it on b3 where it's guarded by a knight and two pawns and getting him off the same file with the rook so that there's no discovered attack upon the bishop. So this is a good example of use all your pieces all the time. So no matter what game we get to, we could pick out a random game. Let's uh, pick out a game from uh, one of my friend's libraries. All right, if we pick out a position here, let's go through a few moves. Okay, if I was in this position and I was white, my rook here is doing something. It's guarding this pawn, but I either want it to be here on this semi-open file, or I want to keep pushing these pawns in such a way that my rook can get in the game. So I'm really worried about that rook on h1. I want to make sure he's doing something. Right now he's doing a little bit, but I'd like him to do a lot more. My other pieces are pretty good. Black, on the other hand, his bishop can't move at all. It's blocked by the knight and the pawn on b7. The rook on e8 is blocked by his pawn. It's a semi-closed file. Here's a semi-open file. It'd be a nice place to put the other rook, 
So if I'm black, I'm looking at maybe playing a break move, like this move uh, c5 here. Let's see what white did. White moved his queen up and threatened a tactic. He wants to bring his queen in and start chasing the king around. Black can't finish his development. He needs to stop that tactic. So he does. He brings the knight back. But that also gets out of the way for the bishop. So what black's trying to do here is get that bishop out, get that rook to the middle. All right? And white's, again, trying to get this rook into the game. Could he go for a sacrifice with his knight here? Well, I don't know. We could ask the computer what his best move is. Stockfish 13, what do you say? Stockfish 13 says, yeah, you can move the knight, Dan, but moving it over here to the middle of the board is even better. But you got to get this rook into the play. Notice white's a lot better here because white's pieces are much more active, even though both sides have the same number of pieces. They both have a queen, two rooks, a bishop, and a knight, and seven pawns. The engine says that white's up three pawns. Why is white up three pawns? Well, primarily because his army is much more active, and they're doing more things, and that leads him later to have the possibility of winning things because his army's much better. So that's why that's the second showstopper. Let's go to the third showstopper. The third showstopper is actually a two-parter. It has to do with using good time management. The first showstopper is when you're playing a game, you want to use almost all your time for the game. So if you're playing a 60-30 game like these two guys are playing, when you're done the game, you want to have like one minute left on your clock. So your goal is to use almost all your time. It's just like taking an essay test in school. If they give you two hours for an essay test and they say, when do you want to hand in your essay? Well, you're not going to hand it in in five minutes. The best way to do it is to take your entire two hours and hand in the essay just when they say pencils down and do the best essay you possibly can do in two hours. Same thing in a chess game. You can't use all your two hours. Your clock will fall and you lose. But you, in this game, with the players have a 30-second increment. 60-30 means 60 minutes for each player, 30 seconds extra for each move. So they have a 30 second increment. So even if they get down to one second and they move, the next move they'll have 31 seconds. <clears throat> so they're trying to use almost all their time for the game. Right now they've played 14 moves and they played 14 moves for white, 14 moves for black. White's used 21 minutes, black has used 16. The second part of good time management is you want to take more time on your critical complicated moves than you want to take on your non-critical non-complicated moves. So for instance, if we go back in this game, let's say, all right, let's say we go back to this move. All right, so black is threatening to take off white's knight, but that's an easy threat and there's many ways to solve it. We could move the knight, we could trade the knight, we could pin the knight. All right, well, that's not a complicated tactic. White has to decide what he wants to do relatively quickly. If his average amount of time on this game is about two minutes a move, you don't want to take two minutes to figure out how to save that knight. Taking one minute should be plenty. So in this case, White decided to develop a piece and pin that knight so that if the knight play, takes on e4, he can play bishop takes d8. And he took, he only took about, uh, a few seconds for that move. So maybe he knew that as a book move. And that's the key. You want to take your time. You see later, white, white and black both slowed down dramatically once they got out of their book. So right now they're starting to get out of their book. They both have about 50, 60 minutes left. Now white has 58. Watch how much time he takes on this move. He takes about a minute to castle. Black plays c6. Now he takes almost 10 minutes, if you count the 30 second increment, to play queen e4. Well, that's way too slow because black wasn't really threatening anything. So queen e4 is a good move, but you shouldn't take 10 minutes even though he's got plenty of time. And if he keeps taking that much time, he's gonna run too low on time. Let's see what happened a few moves later. Okay, white's starting to speed up a little bit, which is good. And they're in an end game. And both sides have about 30 minutes to finish the game. Right here, they're on move 21. They've got the queens off the board. So that's not terrible time management. That's reasonable. But you're trying to get your clock down towards zero. That's the best way we can, uh, that's the best way we can measure. Are you trying the best that you can try? 
If you're trying the best that you can try, then you're playing slow enough that you're using almost all your time, but you're playing fast enough that you're not getting into unnecessary time trouble. The last thing I want to note is I have an awful lot of students now that started playing chess during the pandemic, and they think that like a 10 or 15 minute game is a slow game, and maybe a five minute game is a fast game. And they've never really played slow games in their life. They're not aware of the 45-45 leagues online. They're not aware that if they go to tournaments over the board for the weekend, they're going to get like 90 minutes for each side for the game, or maybe even two hours for serious tournaments. And they, they play time limits that are way, way too fast, and they never learn how to think. So that third showstopper, which is to use your time wisely, starts with picking out a time control where you can learn how to think. If you're not a really good player and you need to learn how to think, you need time to practice finding better moves. The famous principle is if you see a good move, look for a better one. So you need time to do that. So instead of playing 15-10 or 15-0 or 20-0, you want to play 35 or slower and preferably a lot slower. You want to play like these guys are playing 60-30, 60, 60 minutes with a 30 second increment or even slower 90-30. Or 45-45, you Google 45-45 chess, you're going to find a whole bunch of chess leagues online where they play at that popular time limit for online slow games. Really, really important to play those slow games. You can still play some faster games if you want to practice your tactics and your openings and things like that. But if you want to learn how to think and you want to learn how to check to see if your moves are safe, if you want to see good moves and look for better ones, you need more time. Okay, so those are the three showstoppers. Number one, safety. Both your moves have to be safe and you want to check to see if your opponent's moves are not safe. Two, activity. Use all your pieces all the time, including your king in the end game. And three, good time management. Play nice slow games where you intend to use almost all your time. Try to take almost all your time. If the game goes a nice 40 moves or so, try to use almost all your time. And finally, you want to spend more time on your critical complicated moves and play your uncritical, less complicated moves much more quickly. Okay, that's it. The three showstoppers, go get them. See you next time. Like the video, hit the like, subscribe, but more importantly, tell your friends. Thanks.